Hey guys, we're in 2 Chronicles 31. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may your blessings of peace be upon everyone who watches these videos. And please help us understand the wisdom and knowledge that we read today. Father, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for all of our delicious food we have, Lord. And please give us a dose of you since man cannot live on bread alone. And please forgive us for sinning as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes I just like saying the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Second Chronicles 31. This is still the contemporary English version. Okay. The people destroy the local shrines. After the festival, the people went to every town in Judah and smashed the stone images of foreign gods and cut down the sacred poles for worshiping the goddess Asherah. They destroyed all the local shrines and foreign altars in Judah, as well as those in the territories of Benjamin, Ephraim, and West Manasseh. Then everyone went home. Offerings for the priests and Levites. Hezekiah divided the priests and Levites into groups according to their duties. Then he assigned them the responsibilities of offering sacrifices to please the Lord and sacrifices to ask his blessing. He also appointed people to serve at the temple and to sing praises at the temple gates. Hezekiah provided animals from his own herds and flocks to use for the morning and evening sacrifices, as well as for the sacrifices during the Sabbath celebrations, the new moon festivals, and the other religious feasts required by the law of the Lord. He told the people of Jerusalem to bring the offerings that were to be given to the priests and Levites so that they would have time to serve the Lord with their work. As soon as the people heard what the king wanted, they brought a tenth of everything they owned, including their best grain, wine, olive oil, honey, and other crops. The people from the other towns of Judah brought a tenth of their herds and flocks, as well as a tenth of anything they had dedicated to the Lord. The people started bringing their offerings to Jerusalem in the third month, mid-May to mid-June, and the last ones arrived four months later. When Hezekiah and his officials saw these offerings, they thanked the Lord and the people. Hezekiah asked the priests and Levites about the large amount of offerings. The high priest at the time was Azariah, a descendant of Zadok, and he replied, Ever since the people have been bringing us their offerings, we have had more than enough food and supplies. The Lord has certainly blessed his people. Look at how much is left over. So the king gave orders for storerooms to store rooms to be built in the temple, and when they were completed, all the extra offerings were taken there. Hezekiah and Azariah then appointed Conaniah the Levite to be in charge of these storerooms. His brother Shemai was his assistant, and the following Levites worked with them. Jehiel, Azaziah, Nahath, Azahel, Jeremoth, Josabad, Eliel, Ismachiah, Mahath, and Benaiah. Kor, son of Imna, was assigned to guard the east gate, and he was put in charge of receiving the offerings voluntarily given to God and of dividing them among the priests and Levites. He had six assistants who were responsible for seeing that all the priests in the other towns of Judah also got their share of these offerings. They were Eden, Miniamon, Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shechaniah. Every priest and every Levi over 30, over 30 years old who worked daily in the temple received part of these offerings according to their duties. The priests were listed in the official records by clans and the Levites 20 years old and older were listed by their duties. The official records also included their wives and children because they had also been faithful in keeping themselves clean and acceptable to serve the Lord. 
Hezekiah also appointed other men to take food and supplies to, priests, to the priests and Levites whose homes were in the pasture land around the towns of Judah. But the priests had to be descendants of Aaron and the Levites had to be listed in the official records. Everything Hezekiah did while he was king of Judah, including what he did for the temple in Jerusalem, was right and good. He was a, a successful king because he obeyed the Lord God with all his heart. Okay, chapter 32. King Sennacherib of Assyria invades Judah. After King Hezekiah had faithfully obeyed the Lord's instructions by doing these things, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah. He attacked the fortified cities and thought he would capture every one of them. As soon as Hezekiah learned that Sennacherib was planning to attack Jerusalem, he and his officials worked out a plan to cut off the supply of water outside the city so that the Assyrians would have no water when they came to attack. The officials got together a large workforce that stopped up the springs and streams near Jerusalem. Hezekiah's workers also repaired the broken sections of the city wall. Then they built defense towers and an outer wall to help protect the one already there. The landfill on the east side of David's city was also strengthened. He gave orders to make a large supply of weapon and weapons and shields, and he appointed army commanders over the troops. Then he gathered the troops together in the open area in front of the city gate and said to them, Be brave and confident. There's no reason to be afraid of King Sennacherib and his powerful army. We are much more powerful because the Lord our God fights on our side. The Assyrians must rely on human power alone. Those are good verses. These words encourage the army of Judah. When Sennacherib and his troops were camped at the town of Lachish, he sent a message to Hezekiah and the people in Jerusalem. It said, I am King Sennacherib of Assyria, and I have Jerusalem surrounded. Do you think you can survive my attack? Hezekiah, your king, is telling you that the Lord your God will save you from me, but he's lying, and you'll die of hunger and thirst. Didn't Hezekiah tear down all except one of the Lord's altars and places of worship? Okay, the note here says Hezekiah actually had torn down the places where idols were worshipped and he had told the people to worship the Lord at the one place of worship in Jerusalem. But the Assyrian leader was confused and thought these were also places where the Lord was supposed to be worshipped. Okay, and didn't he tell you people of Jerusalem and Judah to worship at that one place? You've heard what my ancestors and I have done to other nations. Were the gods of those nations able to defend their land against us? None of those gods kept their people safe from the kings of Assyria. Do you really think your God can do any better? Don't be fooled by Hezekiah. No God of any nation has ever been able to stand up to Assyria. Believe me, your God cannot keep you safe. Oh my gosh. I bet... He's in for a real surprise. Okay, verse 16. The Assyrian officials said terrible things about the Lord God and his servant Hezekiah. Sennacherib's letter even made fun of the Lord. It said, The gods of other nations could not save their people from Assyria's army, and neither will the God that Hezekiah worships. The officials said all these things in Hebrew so that everyone listening from the city wall would understand and be terrified and surrender. The officials talked about the Lord God as if he were nothing but an ordinary God or an idol that someone had made. The death of King Sennacherib. Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, begged the Lord for help, and he sent an angel that killed every soldier and commander in the Assyrian camp. That's so awesome. Praise God. Sennacherib returned to Assyria completely disgraced. Then one day he went into the temple of his god where some of his sons killed him. The Lord rescued Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from Sennacherib and also protected them from other enemies. People brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and expensive gifts for Hezekiah and from that day on every nation on earth respected Hezekiah. Hezekiah gets sick and almost dies. 
About this same time, Hezekiah got sick and was almost dead. He prayed, and the Lord gave him a sign that he would recover. But Hezekiah was so proud that he refused to thank the Lord for everything he had done for him. This made the Lord angry, and he punished Hezekiah and the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Hezekiah and the people later felt sorry and asked the Lord to forgive them. So the Lord didn't punish them as long as Hezekiah was king. He's so merciful all the time. Hezekiah's wealth, verse 27. Hezekiah was very rich and everyone respected him. He built special rooms to store the silver, the gold, the precious stones and spices, the shields, and the other valuable possessions. Storehouses were also built for his supply of grain, wine, and olive oil. Barns were built for his cattle and pens were put up for his sheep. God made Hezekiah extremely rich, so he bought even more sheep, goats, and cattle. And he built towns where he could keep all these animals. It was Hezekiah who built a tunnel that carried the water from Gihon Spring into the city of Jerusalem. In fact, everything he did was successful. Even when the leaders of Babylonia sent messengers to ask Hezekiah about the so sign God had given him, God let Hezekiah give his own answer to test him and to see if he would remain faithful. Hezekiah dies. Everything else Hezekiah did while he was king, including how faithful he was to the Lord, is included in the records kept by Isaiah the prophet. These are written in the history of the kings of Judah and Israel. When Hezekiah died, he was buried in the section of the royal tombs that was reserved for the most respected kings. And everyone in Judah and Jerusalem honored him. His son Manasseh then became king. Okay, chapter 33. King Manasseh of Judah. I wonder how long these chapters are. They're all kind of long. Stand by. Okay. Okay. King Manasseh of Judah. Just seeing how much long, trying to space out the rest of Second Chronicles. Okay, King Manasseh of Judah. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king of Judah and he ruled 55 years from Jerusalem. Manasseh disobeyed the Lord by following the disgusting customs of the nations that the Lord had forced out of Israel. He built the local shrines that his father, Hezekiah, had torn down. He built altars for the god Baal and set up sacred poles for worshiping the goddess Asherah, and he continued to worship the stars. In the temple, where only the Lord was supposed to be worshipped, Manasseh built altars for the worship of pagan gods and the stars. He placed these altars in both courtyards of the temple and even set up a stone image of a foreign god. Manasseh practiced magic and witchcraft. He asked fortune tellers for advice and sacrificed his own sons in Hinnom Valley. He did many other sinful things and made the Lord very angry. Years ago, God had told David and Solomon, Jerusalem is the place I prefer above all others in Israel. It belongs to me and there in the temple I will be worshiped forever. If my people will faithfully obey all the laws and teachings I gave to my servant Moses, I will never again force them to leave the land I gave to their ancestors. But the people of Judah and Jerusalem listened to Manasseh and did even more sinful things than the nations the Lord had wiped out. That must have been really bad stuff. The Lord tried to warn Manasseh and the people about their sins, but they ignored the warning. So he let Assyrian army commanders invade Judah and capture Manasseh. They put a hook in his nose and tied him up in chains, and they took him to Babylon. While Manasseh held, was held captive there, he asked the Lord God to forgive him and to help him. The Lord listened to Manasseh's prayer and saw how sorry he was, and so he let him go back to Jerusalem and rule as king. Manasseh knew from then on that the Lord was God. 
Later, Manasseh rebuilt the eastern section of Jerusalem's outer wall and made it taller. This section went from Gihon Valley north to Fish Gate and around the part of the city called Mount Ophel. He also assigned army officers to each of the fortified cities in Judah. Okay, at this time, Judah was under the control of Assyria. The fortifications mentioned in this verse may have been done under orders from Assyrian officials, hoping to strengthen their southern border against the rising power of Egypt. Okay, verse 15. Manasseh also removed the idols and the stone image of the foreign god from the temple, and he gathered the altars he had built near the temple and in other parts of Jerusalem. He threw all these things outside the city. Then he repaired the Lord's altar and offered sacrifices to thank him and sacrifices to ask his blessing. He gave orders that everyone in Judah must worship the Lord God of Israel. The people obeyed Manasseh, but they worshiped the Lord at their own shrines. Everything else Manasseh did while he was king, including his prayer to the Lord God and the warnings from his prophets, is written in the history of the kings of Israel. Jose, or the prophets, wrote a lot about Manasseh, including his prayer and God's answer. But Jose also recorded the evil things Manasseh did before turning back to God, as well as a list of places where Manasseh set up idols and where he built local shrines and places to worship Asherah. Manasseh died and was buried near the palace, and his son Amon became king. King Amon of Judah. Amon was 22 years old when he became king of Judah, and he ruled from Jerusalem for two years. Amon disobeyed the Lord, just as his father Manasseh had done, and he worshipped and offered sacrifices to the idols his father had made. Manasseh had turned back to the Lord, but Amon refused to do that. Instead, he sinned even more than his father. Some of Amon's officials plotted against him and killed him in his palace. But the people of Judah killed the murderers of Ammon and made his son Josiah king. Just back and forth, back and forth. Thank the Lord that he's so merciful and forgiving to us. Okay, maybe we'll leave it there and then... Tomorrow, we'll finish up Second Chronicles. Okay, let's do that. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, our Lord, you're so merciful and forgiving. And you pity us when we feel sorry and come back to you. And we're so grateful, Lord. Thank you for always blessing us and for helping us, and for rescuing us, and for choosing us to be yours, Lord. We love you so much, and we're so grateful you died on the cross for our sins, and gave us the gift of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And thank you for loving us more than anything in the world. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, God bless. I love you.